Hello, everyone, and welcome to Yahoo Finance's Breakouts, our interview series where we feature today's most inspiring and innovative entrepreneurs. My name is Melody Hom, and thank you so much for joining us today. Our guest today is Ryan Harwood, the CEO of Gallery Media Group. For those of you who don't know, it's an umbrella company that has Pure Wow, uh, men's lifestyle brand, an influencer marketing arm, and a bunch of other fascinating things like podcasts as well. You know, oftentimes the digital media world is very turbulent, but always fascinating. I want to bring Ryan to the stage. Hello. How's it going? Hello, hello. Take a seat. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. As you can see, it's a pretty full house. Yeah. Um, I'm guessing you you notice some familiar faces, perhaps. Absolutely. <laughs> <There's> one, yeah. <laughs> uh, so thanks so much for taking the time, um, especially on this rainy afternoon, to have a nice chat about your company and your vision for Gallery Media Group. So what's funny is uh, you were talking to my boss before we got on stage yeah. and you were talking about the, the family tree, right? The totally. org of sorts. Yep. If you could draw out for us uh, where Gallery Media Group is in the Gary Vaynerchuk empire, <laughs> that would be pretty epic. Yeah, no, absolutely. So uh, we started a company called Pure Wow nine years ago. It's our women's lifestyle media company. And that was acquired two years ago by Gary Vaynerchuk and Steve Ross. Um, at which time we formed a parent company called VaynerX. And underneath VaynerX, there's several businesses, uh, but the two core media businesses are VaynerMedia, which is the ad agency that Gary started over a decade ago. And then there's Gallery Media Group, which is a sister company to VaynerMedia. And Gallery Media Group is a portfolio of media brands that we're building and buying over time, which is, you know, pure wow sits under Gallery Media Group now. Our mail platform is 1.37 p.m., which launched a little over a year ago. We have the Gallery Podcast Company, which you mentioned, um, a very large-scale portfolio of Instagram accounts, about 40 accounts in different verticals that we manage, and then an influencer marketing arm as well. Yeah, that is a mouthful. <laughs> I have to say, it's very interesting. You seem like a very pleasant guy. Thank you. However, <laughs> to be a man who first launched Pure Wow, which is supposed to be uh, a site for women, it Wasn't is, not supposed to be, it is. <laughs> we'll talk about demos in a second. Yeah. But when you think about that decision initially, yeah. what was the, the trigger there? Yeah. Uh, for those of you who don't know, you had a career in finance. You worked at Goldman for nearly six years in the yep. private bank. Uh, how did you make that sort of a pivot? And was it just a white space opportunity? Totally. Um, it all maps back to happiness, trying to find happiness in your day-to-day -day job. I, I worked in finance, like you said, for six years. I really enjoyed it for the first half of my career. I learned a ton. Uh, highly respect Goldman in the sense that they taught me a lot about how to manage people, about building a culture, about how to read a P&L, all of that <laughs> stuff. Um, but ultimately, I felt that in the middle there, I was, had a little bit of an identity crisis. Um, I was a a college athlete, an athlete my whole life. A tennis player. A tennis player, yes. And um, Fire in the belly kind of was no longer there. And when I was getting up in the morning, looking at myself in the mirror, I just felt that I wasn't being myself, that I wasn't as motivated as I wanted to be. And I missed that. There was a missing part of me. Um, so I went out and spoke to a lot of different friends in a lot of different industries. This was a more than a year process. This wasn't like, oh, you know, I'm deciding I no longer should be in finance and jumped up and started a women's lifestyle company. It didn't work <laughs> like that. Um, so it was at least a year of just explore exploration. Kept gravitating back towards the media and technology landscape for, for several reasons, but really it felt like the people that were in this industry and that were, this was around 2009, 2010, they were happy and excited and it was a growing industry and you can just feel their passion and that was contagious and I wanted that. And I didn't know a lot about the media and tech landscape at all. And at first, I thought I was gonna do something for men. That was a much more obvious choice given what my passion points were. Um, but I serendipitously met a guy named Bob Pittman um, who was the founder of MTV and ran AOL Time Warner for a little while, and now is at iHeart. So he was a, a big media personality, and he gave me market research from the early days of several companies he had invested in. Um, and I essentially looked at the research, and it was 
beyond evident that women are much better consumers than men. Um, in we every way. pocketbook. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that, but also like literally looking at how they, their consumption of content. Mm -hmm. This was the rise of Facebook and they were sharing more, they were consuming more content, they were creating themselves more content on social platforms. And then like you said, when I looked at the advertising landscape, majority of budgets went towards women too. So both from a consumer perspective and a commercial perspective, it felt like they were definitely the, the segment to at least explore. So from that point, I actually looked at the competitive landscape and it was interesting because right before 2010, um, you, this was the men's space actually was innovated on. You had like the five, six, seven years before that, Complex, Thrillist, Bleacher Report, Vice, those guys kind of saw their rise before 2010 to become hot and women's hadn't been innovated on. You still had Condé, Hearst, Time Inc. Those guys were still dominating the, the general advertising budgets for women. Um, that's when I started holding focus groups with women for about six months in their 20s, 30s, 40s, asking them really simple questions like, where are you getting your lifestyle content online? Where are you spending time? I hired a moderator to do that because I had no experience doing yeah. it either. Um, but one thing led to another, and that's how it got started. So were you, was this a side hustle at that point, or you had quit your job at Goldman? You oh. were no longer <laughs> getting a paycheck? Like, how do you balance both? Because totally. we do have a lot of entrepreneurs watching in the audience as well as at home who are constantly curious, when do you quit your day job? When are you supposed to make that trade-off for your dream? Yeah, there is no right or wrong answer to that. To, I mean, I'm looking, I'm trying to see anyone from Goldman here, I hope. <laughs> um, I... I was doing it, the focus groups, while I was still there. Yeah. But left when I eventually said this was gonna, I was gonna be something that I was gonna do. I was actually gonna launch it. I was actually going to start ideating what the brand would be, hire someone. At that point, I had left, but kind of tasting the landscape, I was still there. And you know, to answer your question about what a lot of people are asking, like there is no right or wrong answer about when you're supposed to quit your day job. It, it really should be when you 100% feel it in your bones that this is what you want to do day in and day out and give it your all. That's when you should make that leap. Yeah, what I think is also really interesting is you are the only male yeah. employee until employee number 31. I don't know who that lucky person was <laughs> to really join this gaggle of girls. Yep. Uh, but what was that dynamic like? Because so often we talk about the male-dominated landscape. <laughs> you intentionally surrounded yourself with women yep. uh, to create women's content, rightfully so. How was that dynamic, and was it actually a positive for you um, as the minority? Sure. So in the beginning, it definitely was purposeful to hire women because we were, I needed content creators, of course. Um, after employee like 15, I went with best candidate. They just happened to be women. Amen. So <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I know I did. I went with best candidate. And from 15 to 31, it just was, they were the better candidates. Um, eventually, I found a male that was the better candidate at number 31. But for me, it was actually very comforting. I, I grew up very close to my mom. I had an older sister. My mom's best friend had four daughters. I was always, I had, a, obviously my father was a very important figure in my life as well, but I was surrounded by a lot of women for a very early part of my um, childhood. And it was very, it's very comfortable for me to actually work with and communicate with women. So I liked it. I think it was advantageous for me. And then, you know, from there, obviously we probably have I don't know, 20, 30 guys at this point. Yeah, but, um, out of about 140, yeah. right? Maybe more actually now at this point, but yeah. Yeah, what I think is interesting as you talk about and you bring us back to the the early aughts of digital media, uh, just for those who aren't familiar with the details, Thrillist was started in 2004, Refinery29 and HuffPost tw uh, 2005, BuzzFeed 06, Mike 2011. When you think about the drastic change in narrative, yeah. uh, looking at 2019, looking at the landscape where there's been a lot of consolidation, there's been a lot of heightened scrutiny, not only from the investor side, but also from the consumer side, being like, we're kind of agnostic about all these things, especially when it's the aggregation model and everyone is spewing out the same headline from you know one interview from the Today Show. How do you justify, I guess, the kind of content you're creating, uh, especially when it feels very saturated and it, it, the consumer might not be the same uh, 
that you saw perhaps 10 years ago. Yeah, totally. So first of all, it's funny that you were naming all that, right? Everyone thinks everything's an overnight success. It's not an overnight success. Yeah, I was surprised too, just like looking back yeah. as to the staggering uh, of creation. Yep. It takes it takes time to build a brand, and you know it's it, overnight success is interesting. Like I think Vice has been around for since ninety four. Ninety four, that's crazy. But people didn't hear about it. Yep. It didn't become hot in the press until I don't know two thousand eight or something like yep. that. So it is interesting to hear that. Um, to answer your other question, you know I think that you need to have a mission that you stay true to. So I'll use Pure Wow as an example. We started Pure Wow um, with a hyper focus on trying to target, but broadly we were 25 to 45 year old women, let's call it. But 30s was really where we were dominating. Mid 30s was the core of the audience. And we were trying to um, give her fun and utility at the same time, make her life easier, more manageable, more efficient on a day-to-day -day basis. And over the past, you know, X amount of years, what has become hot, what a lot of our peers have really pivoted drastically to is the political landscape, women's empowerment. And we applaud it and support it, but you haven't seen us make that drastic pivot because that is not what we set out to do to begin with. We would have alienated a lot of our consumers. We were a respite from a lot of that noise that allowed them to find under the radar discoveries. Um, so we stayed true to that. And when we launched 1.37 p.m., which is you know, a brand that is all about the lifestyle of entrepreneurship and how it intersects with culture so much these days, like music, style, and sports. That brand skews male for now. Um, we also made a conscious decision that when we were going to write about entrepreneurs, we weren't going to like, you know, gotcha or, or any of that type of stuff because generally speaking, you know, Gallery Media Group, our mantra is make positivity louder because we feel there is a lot of, negativity and negativity happen especially on social media these days happens to be louder than positivity yes. you know a lot of people like to complain and there's a lot of trolls in the comments so if we can be a source of positivity amongst people's lives not like rainbows and you know fake positivity like just trying to and pump naivety, them up yeah. yeah it's not that it's just more like let's show them all the great things that are going on in this world not point out all the the terrible things that are going on in this world and that happened to line up drastically with a who i am as a person and a lot of this comes top down as you know a ceo drives a lot of the decision making and who the the persona of the company will be so that aligned with who i like to think i am as a human being and then when we were acquired by gary it's absolutely who he is i mean if you follow him on social media you know that he rah rah empathy self-awareness positivity so we were kin in that sense so it it, it felt very natural on that note, though, um, as much as Gary does have the raw, raw, positive side, he's very polarizing, right? Mm -hmm. And some people say, oh, you know what? He's almost too much, and he makes it seem too easy. Uh, is it almost too much of a shill, a little bit of that narrative? Yeah. How do you respond to that? And I think you have done a good job at differentiating yourself, even though you're under you know, Gary's ownership, mm -hmm. uh, but the gallery media group kind of stands alone. But when it doesn't, yeah. how do you respond to criticisms that, okay, maybe we are not supportive of Gary? Um, the last part there. Oh, if, uh, if someone is coming to you being like, we don't really Oh, like Gary, got it, so, got it, got but it. is this brand an extension of Gary as an individual and as, as a human? Totally. So, yeah, gallery media group, even VaynerMedia, to be honest, is completely separate from Gary's personal brand as a human being. He obviously has his marketing beliefs on the Vayner Media side that he trickles down, but like who he is and what he yells on social media and talks mm -hmm. about is is very different from kind of the brands and what we do day to day. That being said, also like he, I think he's one of the most generous, kind human beings like in the planet. So when it comes to like if someone's like I don't like him, like this goes back to like negativity ver yes. being louder than mm -hmm. positivity. Like you don't know him. You've never met him before. You're making a judgment based on what you see. Um, so, you know, there's only so much you can do about that. Of course, like I'm not going to get super defensive about it. It is what it is. But he he really it's not a shill. He right. he actually puts in practice 
all of those things that he talks about and he lives it day to day to day. Mm. You know, he clearly saw an opportunity in Pure Wow because you were profitable yeah. prior to actually getting acquired, which is not what a lot of companies can <laughs> say, even those who, that have gone public in recent months. Uh, even when you look at the numbers, you generated about $20 million in revenue before the acquisition. Revenue has grown by 35% year over year. And I think you reached $36.5 million last year in revenue. What is your projection for this year? Do you anticipate seeing that continued sustained growth? Yeah. Do you see a slowdown? Uh, wh wh how, are you, how are you making that calculus right yeah, now? Yeah, the trajectory is still on a similar track that it has been over the past couple years. You know, I hope it does not slow down. Of course, I mean, we're trying to diversify our revenue in a, in a few different ways, which is why you saw us build out the podcast arm, have a lot of reach and scale on Instagram. We launched a second brand. We do a lot of creative work for clients now, just as someone that has a lot of, a company that has a lot of creative chops just in general. Um, so that's a diversification. We're gonna start to get into original content, experiential, which I know is a hot topic overall in media. Um, so we're diversifying our revenue to continue to see that growth. Um, so yeah. When you say original content, are you are you talking to the likes of Apple, of Netflix? Are you trying to do it alone? A lot of the, the streaming, streaming platforms. platforms yep. Okay. Yep. And how do you anticipate? It, would it be white label? Would it be you? You want to make sure that GMG's name is out there. Yep. How much do you care about the identity of GMG? I think it very much depends on what the topic is, the theme of the content. If it's something that should ladder up to Pure Wow or 137 p.m., then we're going to want that credit. Um, if it's something that we just had an amazing idea and it's kind of agnostic of any of our, our brands individually, then we might not care as much and it might be just for revenue purposes or for getting the GMG name into the ecosystem of original content. And when you look at the landscape of those streaming platforms, who's really impressing you? <laughs> who do you, who is your like ultimate partner yeah. uh, that you feel as you're having these discussions, I'm sure a lot of it you can't talk about, but what you can discuss is whose sure. vision you really uh, admire. So it's interesting because um, a lot of times the person that you might deem the gold standard, which a lot of people are going to say is Netflix, um, might not ne might not be the one that is the most financially beneficial or ownership of IP and a lot of the things that get into the granular negotiations of things. So, you know, the ideal partner, it, it depends. From a prestige perspective, might be very different from what's beneficial to the bottom line for the company. So that's why we're talking to everyone and, and trying to explore what you know, the pros and cons of, of each of those partners. Yeah, it's so interesting, even the idea of experiential uh, revenue, right? Mm -hmm. And Refinery29 has done a very good job at that with 29 rooms. They're really trying to understand where the millennial woman wants to go offline. Yeah. Uh, and I, th I think you've been doing a pretty good job at that, doing your own Broadway shows. You have a Hamptons event this weekend, third annual one. How is your revenue being diversified? Is the ROI there? Are those, are you going to continue to double down on those? Or it feels as though it's nice for brand identity, but it doesn't actually pay off revenue wise. Totally. I th actually think, um, complex con has done the best job of it because when I think of, um, experiential going forward, before, like you said, the Broadway show, that was that was done for revenue purposes. There was a brand partner that was attached Olay, to that. right? Yes. So there was a brand partner attached to that in Procter & Gamble. Um, when we are about to embark and invest a lot more in experiential, like for instance, we have a, a podcast. It's the number one parenting and family podcast. It's called Mom Brain, and it's hosted by Daphne Oz and Ilaria Baldwin. Um, we want to bring that to life. And we're going to do the Mom Brain Carnival in October here in New York City. That's going to be one we're going to be investing a lot more than we usually have. Um, with Pure Wow going forward in the Hamptons, for me, when I think about experiential, you know, where in the past it was strictly a revenue thing, and like if we make money off of it, let's do it. Now it's a little bit, like you said, the landscape is getting crowded for digital media in general. And in order to stand out, you need to build something that transcends culture a little bit. ComplexCon did a good job of that. It transcended culture. Whether you read them or not, you knew what it was. Right. And if you were a guy that was into sneaker culture or anything like that, you knew what it was. So I think bringing the brand to life and allowing people to touch it and taste it and allowing influencers and celebrities to want to be a part of it, 
that's really valuable for making your brand stand out from the noise. Also, I think, you know, you want to walk before you run type thing. Well, at least that's how we run our business. And I like to, uh, I feel like now we're at a point where I can actually sell tickets to the audience, especially mm -hmm. with Pure Wow. So Mom Brain will be probably the first one where we're actually selling tickets to our readership. Um, so those are some of the things that go through my mind when it comes to experiential. Yeah. Speaking of Mom Brain, um, the podcast business, it's interesting. Spotify just reported earnings. They actually doubled their audience uh, since the beginning of this year as they've really doubled down with their recent acquisitions. Do you feel as though it's hard to uh, not only maintain talent, but create talent? Because as you mentioned, Ilaria Baldwin, Daphne Oz, they were already personas sure. and they're already characters yeah. how are you making homegrown talent is that something you care about or you're just trying to acquire kind of people who already have a social following and a cult following yep for the time being we've focused on existing personalities people that already are either celebrities or macro influencers of sorts that's who we've been partnering with we have one show that we didn't do that we were homegrown which is called royally obsessed which is all about the royals but that was because it was very topical in nature and we write a lot about the royals on pure wow and it just was a very natural. We have a big Instagram account about the Royals, so it was kind of... Why are people so obsessed with the Royals? Yeah, your guess is as good as mine. I don't know. <laughs> that, that's like way over <laughs> me. I don't know. They my, are my whole team loves it, but... <laughs> I know, it's wild. Um, so, but for the most part, we are not necessarily trying to build personalities as opposed to partner with them for the time being. Yeah, as you have continued to grow, um, and perhaps in the next iteration, as you try to come up with those personalities... How have you been able to balance this idea of growth with maintaining your kind of scrappy culture? Because uh, pre-acquisition, you're at about 75 people, which is still quite large. It's not a tiny startup, but I think there was an element, I'm sure, that Gary even identified being like, wow, this is something special, and this is something that we have to con continue to cultivate and grow. Sure. Um, but I'm sure you face those roadblocks of how do we still feel fun and lively yeah. and entertaining while also caring about P&L and bottom line? 100%. And I think this is just not unique to us. I think if you look at any startup that's crossing over kind of a 125, 150 yep. range, like it's pretty well documented that that is a milestone that you need to start to figure out how to scale the unscalable, uh, especially in, in a cultural sense. So these are things that like I'm spending a lot of time on right now, more than actually usual in trying to figure out how to keep that special sauce alive because it you know, we ran our company and we still do run our company much more like an entrepreneur did from 1965 than a Silicon Valley entrepreneur from 2015 because we never raised a ton of money. We raised money, but not a ton of money, like one fifteenth the size of who I was competing against. So did we you have angels or you actually had VCs pre-acquisition. It was a mixture, a mixture, but very few v actual pure VCs. It was more family office and yep. angels because, you know, I, I saw what, you know, first of all, I can go down a whole rabbit hole of fundraising if you want me to, but like sticking on on this for a second, like when when it comes to when it comes to culture um, and trying to scale that, it is something that needs to be focused on and and really like for me, for instance, I personally was able to touch every single person one through seventy five, even probably one through a hundred. Once you get to one fifty, you can't necessarily yeah. one on one and have that deep relationship. So lately, I've been trying to do 10 on one dinners, 15 on one dinners so that you can give transparent thought into the rationale. I started something that's called ask me anything where I have anonymous questions come in and, you know, for time's sake, instead of getting up and doing a whole town hall every week, I can just go face the camera on my iPhone and send the video to the company answering any questions that come my way so they can understand what's going on in my head. So that we're addressing kind of how when a company gets to be a certain size, Things change. Yeah. Uh, speaking of that, when you think about retention rate, and I think a lot of small business survey after survey talks about how talent is the most difficult thing. Yeah. And in a tight labor market, despite a lot of the, the noise around the economy, overall, the economy is doing okay. Yep. And when you think about uh, how hard it is to find competitive talent, are you finding that to be the case? Is it feeling like more of a pressing issue recently over the last sure. couple of years? You know what's interesting is I don't necessarily think it has to do with um, the last couple years versus years before that. It has much more to do with when you're at a certain size of a company and you're trying to take that company to the next level, that continues to get more and more and more challenging when you're trying to go from 40 million to 70 million in revenue or whatever it is. That means you've got to be that much 
better at what you do and you need really good talent. And now you're also, you know, for a long time we were homegrown talent yep. and sometimes you have to bring in people from the outside as well. So uh, it, it's much more about, yes, it, talent is the most important thing. It is the most challenging part. If you tell me what keeps me up at night, it's definitely like finding talent in order to get to the next level. Mm. And what is the common thread among your 150 employees? What is that one thing that you feel like is the defining yeah. root of GMG's culture? So we, we have some pillars that we look for when we're hiring that I, I like to think that we've been fairly good at trying to find that amongst them. Um, we screen for sense of entitlement mm -hmm. and ego. Um, we feel that's the root of all toxicity in any company when someone is entitled. Um, and what we look for is passion, really good communication, curiosity. We think people that are curious are going to continue to want to evolve. And then, you know, more than anything else, just are they a kind, generous human being? Like, are they a nice individual? Do you want to be around them and talk to them every day and be in a meeting? Because there's a lot of debates that occur. And if you're going to jump into a meeting, a conference room, and you disagree, you want to you be able to trust that person and know that they're going to be able to tactfully disagree with you, not kind of kill the momentum in a room. No, that's a good point. And I feel like that kindness component is underrated oftentimes because you, people are looking for the go-getter, hustler type, but oftentimes they're, uh, you know, they might sell themselves that way, but a in actuality, the work might not deliver. I want to get into the demos a little bit. And also for those of you watching here, please prepare your questions because we do have time for an Ask Me Anything uh, in person. Uh, at the end, so in about five minutes. So get get your questions going. And just to touch on that, yeah. Piece, the, uh, what did you say right before that, though? Demo. No, before that. I don't know. I had something good well, I was well, going to say. Well, we'll no. rewatch it. Okay. <laughs> it's on VOD. What? Uh, oh, the Underrated. hiring, hiring, mm -hmm. hiring. Uh, Thanks, you know, Andy. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I'm actually. I want to make this clear. Like for the first few years. I did not hire like that, and I made mm -hmm. a lot of mistakes as a result. I looked at resume paper like went for the person that looked best on paper and learned the hard way that like that just doesn't work um and after like when i got to about year three i started to get a cadence for what i was really looking for so i don't want to make it seem like you knew right away i knew yeah. right away because that's not the case totally um when you think about the there's a morning consult poll that i i I, I think about this every week, yeah. right? And it came out last year. 49% of Gen Z get most of their news from social media, but, but Gen Z actually prefer older media. So they like the OG. They really like time. They feel like New Yorkers, reputable. And it's almost because they grew up in this wave of fake news where you're yeah. not supposed to believe anything. You're not supposed to believe these digital upstarts. I understand you're not in the strict news business. You're in sure. lifestyle. But when you hear something like that, does that give you pause about, okay, what is the future of this brand if we can't get the younger generation? Um, especially when you look at your demo right now, they're moms and, and they're in their 30s, 40s, 50s. Totally. So, yeah, how are you trying to get, get the younger folks who are a little bit more hesitant? Yeah, I mean, I think you're never going to be able to convince somebody that, like, we produce quality content. Like, the, the content needs to be great. And the content will be shared to other quality people that want content that is not fake news. So as long as we are focused on the right things, which is, you know, I'm, I'm not, we're, like you said, we're not news content. So it is very, very different. I have a lot of empathy for folks that are in the pure news. That, that is a very challenging space to be in right now. For lifestyle, there's a little bit more leniency and, and people are going to be more subjective in what they like to read and what gives them a warm, fuzzy feeling versus like what they don't enjoy reading and it's not worth their time. So for us, it's, it's about creating content that we think is going to add value to her life to give, or his life or you know, give a surprise to the audience every single day or just make it better. Yeah, and what would you be doing if you weren't the CEO of GMG? Woo! Um, I know you have two young children. I do. So maybe a stay-at-home dad? Maybe. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> uh, I, Your ambition is too much. <laughs> you know, I always loved, uh, I love music, and matching up music to soundtracks of movies is something that, like, I've always wanted to, like, explore. Wow. And do, like, match, yeah, whether it's a TV show or a movie, like, being able to pick the songs that go at the certain times. 
one day I'll do that. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, is that something that you've done on the side for fun? I used to you a little to? bit, not to soundtracks and movies, <laughs> uh, uh, but like for my friends, like, yes, prior to Pure Wow, um, I definitely used to like create videos um, and match up music within those videos of like trips we used to take. Like I was that guy. That oh yeah, stuff. everyone needs that guy. Yeah, so you guy. you had the media in you from early on. I had the creativity in me yes. more than media, but like it's funny. I, I always for the first three four years of of being in media, I always was like, oh, I'm not the I'm not the creative. I'm I'm the numbers guy. I'm on the sales side of things. And what I've realized is I actually. I'm more creative than I am numbers. I'm lucky I have a guy named Phil right over there that helps me with the numbers. Shout out, Phil. <laughs> Making that revenue work. <laughs> so we're going to take questions from the audience. So if people want to start lining up in the back, that would be much appreciated. And do not be shy. This is only going to how many hundred thousand people? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you can start lining up there. Yes, just stand up at the mic. And please introduce yourself. Hi, my name is uh, Steve. Steve. And I found it interesting you talking about your vi video strategy. Obviously, you're, you're a brand, but are, is your strategy to really create content on your site or act more of like you produce this content and license it to Netflix, to Amazon, sure. and then internationally, et cetera, et cetera? And can you kind of just talk about like what kind of video content you're trying to produce? Is it long form? Is it mm -hmm. short form? Is it for Instagram? And just kind of walk through all that. Totally. Um, so yes to all of the above, but to get more granular than that is we're not necessarily creating a lot of video on site. On site is much more article based and text based. A lot of our video long form is living on YouTube. And then we do a lot of Instagram TV right now. We obviously put video in, in Twitter and Facebook as well. But we, we, when we're creating video these days, it's very much through a lens of primarily YouTube and Instagram TV and then it can go to the other places as well. And then the, the streaming platform stuff is completely separate. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah. Uh, are you on Snapchat? What are your thoughts on Snap? You're not, We're not. at all. We're not on Snapchat. That's so interesting. Yeah. What, what made you decide not to? <laughs> you know, picking and choosing our battles in terms of where we were gonna put our resources, A. Um, B, Pure Wow, which was the main focus for so many years had a different demographic yeah. than what skewed to Snapchat, mm -hmm. so it didn't feel like necessarily the most natural fit. Um, with 1.37 p.m., we do talk about it, but there's other platforms that like, you know, Twitch and TikTok, like yeah. you need to pick and choose your battles, at least for someone like us that didn't raise $100 million and, and isn't going to just throw against and the And has wall. a budget of $5 million to hire, you know, a whole team of Snapchatters. Snapchat designers, yeah. right, exactly. Because Snapchat is, we found, at least in the past, maybe not anymore, they've changed things, but it, it was expensive to create Snapchat stories and, and what they called, like, their magazines and stuff. So we needed to Focus. prioritize. Yeah. Hi, my name is LaCoy Todman, founder of Grand Royalty. And my question to you is, what was a pivotal strategy that took you from where you were to where you wanted to be in terms of scaling your business? I love the delivery of that yeah. question. That was, was so intense. dramatic. Yeah. Was I like it. <laughs> Landed on me. Um, <laughs> I think that the, the hiring stuff we were talking about before was a, a huge, huge moment because I was, like I said, I was hiring off of paper and skill set more than trying to build a machine of people that loved working with each other and like really in enjoyed coming to work every single day. So when that clicked and in 2000, I think it was like 13, we hired a senior layer of management and I was really fortunate that I got those hires right because that was a pivotal moment in the company's history. And we hired our first editor in chief, our first head of sales, head of finance, et cetera. And you know, we were a united front up top, like from a cultural perspective, what we believed in, it was impenetrable from that perspective. There was trust, loyalty, and what we believed in. So people got weeded out fairly quickly if you didn't um, believe in that same way of, of living and working. Uh, so I'd say that was a major, major. Second question. I don't yeah, OK, that. give it to me. <laughs> what was the contrast in hiring your executives versus the entry level positions? What do you mean by contrast? Like okay, so when you when you hire an executive, they have a bigger role, a bigger responsibility, sure. and you're working with them more, and yeah. uh, they have their input is more valuable than a repetitive task that needs to be done within the business. In contrast to like a entry level position, mm -hmm. so the, when you hire a COO or a CIO or a CTO, 
they, or CFO, they have to be more experiential. Uh, ex experienced. Experienced, well, I was gonna say experiential, <laughs> but ex <laughs> experienced <laughs> for, um, for the role than um, someone who's like just doing something like repetitive that needs saying. to be done. Yeah, um, we still put the same filter and layer on the type of person we're looking for regardless of what level of experience they're in. Um, the only difference would be obviously if we're hiring for someone at an executive or C-suite level, they obviously have to have some experience doing what they're doing and we have to believe that they have managed people and have had certain skill sets in order to take on those roles and responsibilities. But from a core human being perspective, it's no different. Check the ego at the door. Check the ego at the door. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and what is, thank you so much. Thank what you is your um, exit strategy? As you think about, I was just thinking about all those C-level employees he's, he's rattling off. When are they going to get their uh, liquidity? Well, as you know, we were acquired already. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but when you think about IPO potential, yeah, yeah. is this something that you would potentially want to, in order to yeah. unlock that next level, as you say, do you feel like sustaining it right now is enough? Totally. So when I talk about this with Gary, because obviously I have a business partner now that owns more of the business, um, when I talk about this with Gary, very much is trying to build the biggest building. Um, he's not trying to sell the business necessarily to, because there actually is no natural suitor if you think about it. Like he built an agency, he's not, he doesn't want to sell to a holding company. We built a media company. We're not looking necessarily to sell it to a bigger media company. I don't think an IPO is in the cards. I don't think Gary would be someone that wants to be a public uh, yeah. CEO. Um, so I think we're trying to build a huge, huge, communications death star continue to build the machine into what we believe in works in modern day media like the reason why we placed our bets in a lot of those areas that i talked about outside of the media brands podcast instagram it's because we believe that's where attention is right now and that's where consumer attention continues to shift but that might not be accepted in a publicly traded company because revenue might lag. Right. Or it might not be accepted in even uh, a venture-backed company that has to look at, you know, every 90 days report to their investors because revenue might lag. So I think the way we do things is much, m we're trying to be very practical and do what we believe in, which is kind of refreshing. Hi, my name is Reggie. I wanted to know, as a change of career person, what was the toughest challenge you faced when you got off your um, financial career path? Yeah. Whew. Are you trying to leave us, Reggie? <laughs> <laughs> no, never, never. <laughs> so, you know, I had to, making the switch, I had to convince myself that, and whether this was true or not, who knows, but I, I convinced myself of it, that r whether I could always go back to finance, because you never want to kind of like feel like, oh my God, I might be without a backstop. I, I might, I'm going to go to zero income. Like that's not a good feeling. So I, I convinced myself that, you know what, if this doesn't work, I can go back to finance. So convincing myself of that was definitely a big challenge. And then once I made the leap of faith, um, I think that learning a whole new industry while also being a first time CEO and entrepreneur, it was kind of a, all of it was a big learning curve all at once, but that was a blessing and a curse because I think it, it actually worked in my favor in the sense that I was not jaded. I had no perception of what the media industry was supposed to be. Um, so I just looked at it from a straight common sense perspective. And then same with building a business. I had no perception of like how this is supposed to be done. And I just did it from a gut and common sense perspective. With your banker colleagues though, I'm sure you got a lot of crap. Yeah. Or when you were leaving, were they like, what is wrong with you? Did you get a lot of the hatred? Did you get a lot of the skepticism? Or were there people who were like, you know what? I'm so proud of you, man. Like, go off and do your thing. Yeah. Definitely not hatred. Um, not hatred. Cynicism. Cynicism. Of yeah. course, there was cynicism. I mean, if you had a 27-year-old guy <laughs> go up to you and say he was starting a women's lifestyle digital media company, <laughs> pretty sure everybody in this room would have cynicism. So, um I, yeah, there was definitely snickers behind yeah. my back and laughs and yeah, that you just got to have thick skin. Yep. I was a confident young guy, fortunately at that point. And <laughs> if anything, it, you're not, it, you're not today. No, not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, it gave me a chip on the shoulder. If anything else, it was, it was one of those things. I remember in tennis when I was like 12 years old, there was a kid that came up to me that would have been playing a lot longer than me and was like, 
you're never going to be as good as us. And there was like a group wow. of kids. And, no, seriously. It's like something that vividly sticks out in my head. And like, God, like that for years, that like boom, boom, boom stuck in my head and helped me propel. And like, it was the same thing for this. It's like when people doubt you, I kind of like being doubted. I like being the underdog a little bit. It, it, it's easy to find motivation in that. Sometimes being at the top is harder than when you're not. Did you hit that kid up? <laughs> I did. I beat you want him, me to twice. Find him on <laughs> I feel like you should find him on Facebook and be like, look what I'm up to these days. <laughs> we have another question. Hi, my name is Keith Johnson. Uh, Keith. I also worked at iHeartMedia. Cool. Uh, actually, I'm still there. Nice. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> So many career changes happening You're today. Right. <laughs> um, how did you meet Bob Pittman, and how influential <laughs> was he to you? Because he's currently our CEO. Yes, I'm very aware. I had dinner with him a couple weeks ago. Um, I met Bob through a mutual friend, one of my dear friends in college introduced us, and he was a huge influence. I mean, he was the only resource I had that knew media at the time. I was not a media guy. So for the first, which by the way, was another very comforting thing to make the jump from finance to that, was that I had at least a few mentors in place that I felt that could, you know, if I had to bounce questions off of. So I do think that's important to have a support system, even though they're not, you know, he was not day to day. He definitely did not get in the weeds with me by any means of how to build this business. But if I had a macro level question, yes, I could bounce it off him. And he was, he had a vested interest in making the company successful. So uh, he was a major influence and I, I still admire him. And how did you meet Gary V? And at what point was your business at when you met Gary? Yeah, I met Gary at a rooftop Gawker event. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. Gawker 2.0 is being scrapped. Yeah, this was Gawker <laughs> 1.0. Yeah. Uh, back in 2000, I want to say 2011, maybe. I met him. It was a rooftop party. Uh, also introduced through a mutual friend. We just started chatting. I was had no success at all at this point, and he was the most generous with his advice and time. Like, he was already successful. He had a personality, he had a brand. Everyone wanted to talk to him at the party and stuff, and literally spent, like, a solid 20 minutes talking to me, had no business, no reason to do it, really was interested in what I was saying, even though he didn't have reason to be. Uh, and I, you know, he's very charismatic, and he was someone that I gravitated towards, and we, from there, had a friendship uh, in 2015, so four years later, when I was raising my first, like, real round, he did put money in from his Vayner RSC fund, his partnership with Steve Ross, so they put a little bit of money in. At that point, he had a front row seat to understanding what we were actually building, um, and he was able to see the financials. Two years later, the acquisition occurred. Wow. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, was Bob an early investor as well? He was the first investor. He was the first investor. Yes. Uh, and what was one piece of advice that he gave to you that you you found very valuable? Because I, I understand a lot of people always ask, right, yeah. how do you find that mentor? And yeah. what is the point of that so-called mentor? Totally. Uh, what was that, that thing that he told you that you felt like would be valuable? Yeah. He, he at a very early stage, he told us to stand our ground on what our value was when we were out going out to the market and selling because it's very easy when you are a startup that doesn't have, you don't have confidence yet in your brand and what you're selling yet because you're really starting up that it's very easy to kind of like drop your guard and be like, yeah, I'll take the money, like yeah. give it to me and like set a precedent that that's gonna be what you are charging. So he was very adamant about two things actually. Uh, one was that like set your floor, do not go below it stick to it and be persistent about it. And then two was for the first three years of existence, no marketing. Mm. He did not let us spend a dime of marketing. Um, he wanted the content to be good enough where it was going to be shared on its own. So again, blessing and a curse blessing. Cause we built a very organic audience that loved our content for what it was. Um, curse because like, yeah, we could have grown a lot quicker and been part of that, you know, whole, vice conversation, that whole craze sooner and, you know, maybe higher valuations, all that stuff. Right. But, you know, I'm thankful for the advice because it, it, what it did was it made us learn how to actually build a sustainable real business that, and like learn how to make money, which when you look right now, 
is the, probably the most valuable skill set we have as an organization. Yep. Like very even true. if the economy dipped or went in a different direction, like we we know how to be profitable and be sustainable and we haven't gotten ahead of our skis. What a refreshing perspective. We'll end on that note. Okay. Thanks so much to Ryan. Let's give it up for Ryan. Thank you. Woo!